today, I don't know, you know, this, it's not on the calendar as a holiday. It's not listed anywhere, but 117 million people, they say, will be watching the Super Bowl. Everybody's heart, mind, and attention is on the Super Bowl. If you're going to the grocery store, they've got it stacked with all kind of food. They got all kind of beer stacked, root beer that is, and chicken wings and all of those things will be served today. So football is on our mind. Well, I'm going to use that today. Since your mind is already on it, <laughs> I, I, I'm going to keep it on it. And I'm going to speak metaphorically from Matthew 20, verses 17 and 19. And I do solicit your prayers, church. I, I truly mean that. Um, Matthew 20, the New International Version, the NIV says, now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. On the way, he took the 12 aside and said to them, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priest and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked, flogged, crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. That's enough. That's enough. I want to talk from the subject. On my way up. The red zone. On my way up. To the red zone. In the National Football League, there is a term that is used that is called the red zone. In the NFL, the football field is 100 yards from one goal to the other goal. In order for the offense to score a touchdown and get six points, they have to advance the ball from one goal line to the other. 100 yards and then cross the goal line either with a pass or with a running play. But when they get to the 20 yard line of their opponent, it is called the red zone. And the reason why it's called the red zone, even though the offense has advanced the ball for 80 yards and only has 20 yards to go, to get to the goal, it is the most difficult area on the field in order to score. You would think that after you had advanced the ball 80 yards, simply to go 20 more yards would not be that difficult. But that's the hardest area on the field. Somebody say red zone. That's why they call it the red zone. You have advanced the ball. You've gone from one first down to another first down, one pass to another pass. From up the middle, you have used everything within your arsenal to make the goal. So now, you have come 80 yards. And now, it is so difficult to get 
to the goal. You would think it would be easy since the field is shorter. But it's not. The coaches on the defense team bring in new defensive schemes, new players. They're fresh. They haven't played until you get in the red zone. And spiritually speaking, when you get near your goal, Satan calls in some new devils. Some that you didn't have to deal with. <laughs> Back at the 40-yard line. <laughs> you cleared that. <laughs> but now, ha, I'm near my spiritual goal and Satan don't like it. And he tries to get you to throw in the towel. It's the red zone. The defense is stronger. The defense is tighter. The field is shorter. <laughs> now watch this. Put this up. The closer you get to the goal, the harder it is to get to the goal. I think I just said something. Those of you who are goal-oriented, some of you have done your yearly planners. You've marked down things that you've got to get done, that you want to get done. You're goal-oriented. Huh. Remember this. The closer you get to the goal, the harder it is to get to the goal. Write that down on your planner. It gets tough. The text that I read to you, hmm, Jesus is getting ready to go up <laughs> to the red zone. <laughs> this is the passion period. Jesus is getting ready to suffer. This is the time that he will experience suffering at the hands of his enemies. This is the time, his last trip to Jerusalem, where he will take our place and die on Calvary's cross for our sins. He has advanced 80 yards in his ministry. Only 20 more yards to get to Jerusalem to die for your sins and mine. But now, ha, ha, ha. The enemy, somebody say the enemy. The defense tightens up on you. He's in the red zone because the enemy wants to do everything in his power to keep Jesus from his purpose. Did you get that? But the text says in Matthew 20 and 17, that Jesus is going up to Jerusalem and he's got to get to Jerusalem to live out the purpose for which he comes to planet Earth for. I know he's healed the sick. I know he's raised the dead. I know he's healed withered hands. I know he's given sight to the blind. But he didn't come just to heal the sick. That's not why he came. He didn't just come to heal the withered hand. But that's not why he came. In fact, he says, even when he prays, he says, for this cause came I <laughs> unto the world. He came into the world to die for your sins. And mine, he came to pay the penalty for our sins. He had to position himself in Jerusalem to live out his purpose. And the enemy will try to get Jesus to be satisfied with giving sight to the blind and to doing all the miracles and healings but his face is steadfast, <laughs> trying, 
towards Jerusalem. I know my purpose. I know what I've got to do. You're not going to sidetrack me and just have me being a healing preacher. Preach, Pastor Shannon. I think I am. I've got greater works for you. Hmm. So he's got to go up to Jerusalem. He has to reach the pinnacle of his purpose. Oh, I love that. Going up to Jerusalem to reach the pinnacle of his purpose. And some of us are real close to our purpose, to our goal. But the enemy is now bringing in some specialists <laughs> to keep you from getting to your goal. See, some of us think that when life gets hard and when life gets difficult and I have to face the pressures and, 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 and the precautions and the problems and the persecutions uh, of life. Some of us think uh, we're going in the wrong direction. I must have done something wrong. All this to be going down uh, in my marriage, all of this to be going down uh, with my money, with all uh, my trials, with all my personal life. I must be moving in the wrong direction. But listen, sometimes pressure doesn't mean that you've been living wrong. Sometimes, somebody say sometimes. It means that you've been living right. It means you are very close to what God has for you. You are just about ready to reach your goal. And now the enemy is trying to stop you because, put that up again, text, the closer you get to your goal, the harder it is to get to your goal. You need to write that down. You need to do some self-talk. Amen. Now listen to what Jesus says. Y'all going to help me preach this. Now y'all know I'm a little old man and I need all the help I can get. Now, Jesus pulls the disciples to the side. The text opens up with Jesus going up to Jerusalem. He's going up to the holy city. And when you're on your way to holiness, you're going to catch some hell. Ooh. He's on his way up to Jerusalem, the central place of worship for the Hebrew people. But when you're on your way to a place of worship, you're going to run into some people who are wicked. He's on his way up to Jerusalem. You young adults, listen to me. Because some of us think the church and church people are supposed to be perfect and ideal, and they are not. The devil comes to church. He can shout. He can quote and misquote scripture. On his way up to Jerusalem to live out his purpose. But while you're trying to live out your purpose, you're going to run into some perversion. Now, the text says, verse 17, he pulls his 12 disciples to the side. A huddle, if you will. He says, not to everybody, but to his 12 disciples. We are going up. Why don't somebody say that? We are going up. Now remember, Jesus has healed multitudes. Amen? 
He's fed multitudes. He's blessed multitudes. But when it was time to go up to Jerusalem, he pulled his 12 disciples, his 12 who were disciplined, his 12 who were learners, his 12 followers, his 12 church members, if you will, because everybody is not going up. And that's one of the reasons why it is so difficult for us to go up. Because other folk who are low down don't want to see you go up. How many people stop talking to you and stop wanting to be around you when you put down all of them habits? I like that word. I can say it, but I'll, 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 I'll let you personalize it. <laughs> when, when you put down all them habits. I ain't going over there, man. He, we used to get high together. He don't get high no more. But Jesus pulls his disciples, <laughs> he, the 12, and, and he, the, his followers and his believers, he tells them, we, don't you like that we? <laughs> that collective pronoun, <laughs> that means Jesus <laughs> has got to be in the mix. It's a we thing. I'm not going up by myself. Oh, come on, church. I'm not going up by myself. It's a, it's a we, me and Jesus. Huh? We, 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 we going up. And you know what? I love that. It doesn't matter what it looks like to you. It may look like I ain't going to make it. It may look like I'm not going to pull through. It may look like I'm not going to always be where I've always been. But I know what my Jesus has promised me. And, and when I started my journey, he said, we. When I started my journey, he said, I thought y'all promised me you going to help me. When I started my journey, he said, hey. Because sometimes it looks like you're in the fight all by yourself. Friends have turned their back on you. Your phone don't ring like it used to. But you got to remember, you're not by yourself. He has said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. It's a we thing. Oh, I like that. Why don't you tell somebody it's a we thing? I'm not by myself. And you know, I have to keep telling myself that. Since my wife died, I'm by myself 98% of the time. Huh. But I have to say, it's a we thing. Tell one more person, it's a we thing. Mm. I'm so glad. Huh. Notice Jesus did not say you are going up. He said, <laughs> because you can't make it without Jesus. Remember that. The promise is not that you're going to make it on your own. The promise is if you're with the we crowd, if you stick with the Jesus group, some of us are saying, as soon as I get up, I will hook up with Jesus. Some of us are saying, when I get to that certain economic level, when I get my money right, when I get my success together, when I go up, then I'm going to get with Jesus and get with the church. Jesus is saying, listen, you're not going up and leaving me behind. Listen, you can't put Jesus down and you go up. Oh, let me say that again. Young people, you 20 and 30 year olds, listen to me. You can't put Jesus down and you go up. I know you're looking at some folk in your group. And they don't go to church. They don't pay tithes. They don't do none of that. And they driving BMWs, got a nice home, good job. But listen, huh, you need more blessings than a new car and a home. Oh, y'all don't hear me. 
How are you going to leave him behind? You advance to your goal. You are going to need Jesus on your journey. You have to get it in your head that life is too big for you to handle without Jesus. Let me say it again. Life is too big for you to handle without Jesus. What are you talking about? Because sometimes it's this and sometimes it's that. That's why we sang the song. It's all ha, in your hands, Lord. Listen, you can't put Jesus down and you go up. How are you going to leave him behind and you advance to your goal? You're going to need Jesus on your journey. Amen. You got a good job and making some money. You got some paper. You got family. But life is too big for you to handle it without Jesus. Money without Jesus is poverty. Success without Jesus is failure. Education without Jesus is ignorance. Logic without Jesus is presumption. Marriage without Jesus is miserable. A home without Jesus is like hell. Life without Jesus is death. And salvation without Jesus is impossible. No wonder grandmama said, I like that, grandmama said, you may have this whole world, but give me, oh, come on, church, you can have this whole world, but give me. And then when they got through saying that, they said, I got Jesus. And that's enough. I don't need nothing else. And then they took it a little further. They said, he's water. When I'm thirsty, he's a friend. When I'm friendless, he's a way maker. When I need a way made, can't nobody do me like Jesus. Now, when you're on your way up, when you hook up with Jesus, he already has a design to go in one direction. Somebody say one direction. And we're going up. But in this text, in verse 18, he's trying to let you know. 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds. He's trying to let you know that you're going to run into some pressures and some persecution in your journey. I know the popular theme of the day is when we accept Jesus, oh, I'm going to have an abundant life. Everybody's going to love me. I'm going to have everything that I ever wanted. And any time I get an ache and a pain, all I have to do is call on Jesus and he'll heal my body. <laughs> well, listen up. Let me say this again. When you're on your way up, when you hook up with Jesus, he already has designed to go in one direction, and we're going up. But in this text, in verse 18, he's trying to let you know that you're going to run into some pressures and some persecution in your journey. I know you're going up. You can't help it. You're a disciple now. You're going up. But Jesus wants you to understand that there is some stuff you need to understand in your journey. He says, Pastor, what are you talking about? Jesus says, the Son of Man will be betrayed. You see that? Did you see that in the text? You will be condemned. You see that? 
you will be turned over. You will be mocked. You will be beaten. You will be crucified. Jesus wanted me to let you know today that in your, on your way up, look for some betrayal to come your way. You cannot go up without experiencing being betrayed. Somebody close to you is going to end up being a traitor to you. You cannot betray folks that are not close to you. So the person you least expect oftentimes become the one who becomes the betrayer in your life. That's that ace boon coon. That's that running buddy. That's your road dog. We've been knowing each other since third grade. Huh. We, we've been friends huh. since the third grade. And that's the one Jesus wanted me to let you know that will be a stabbing in your back. Huh? But you've got to go through to get to the level he's trying to take you to. Now, you know, some of us are idealists. You know, I started not to leave that in there. But we got, a, I don't know what we raise in today. But we got a lot of ideas. Oh, don't tell me nothing rough and hard. I don't want to hear about slavery. Mm -mm. I don't want to hear about what they did to us. And the other folk are saying, amen. We're just idealists. We want to live in the ideal world. We say, well, I've given my life to Jesus. Now everybody's going to be on my side. Hmm? And you know, I've joined church. I'm doing all I know to do and being taught to do it. And I'm serious with my walk with the Lord. And I'm even going to join one of the auxiliaries in church when this pandemic is over. I'm trying to get everything in order. And I know everybody's going to be proud of me. And everybody is going to pat me on the back. And you are an idealist. I love Jesus so, therefore, won't everybody love me? Hmm? You are an idealist. And we do not live in an ideal world. An idealist cannot handle difficulties. When idealists face difficulties and defeat, they become one of the world's greatest cynic. And you know why? It's not fair. I've done everything I was supposed to do. It's not fair. And I'm going to tell you something. People are hot. I hear that. They turn me off. Fair? Who ever told you life was going to be fair? Where would you read that at? They don't treat me fair. Well, what do you want me to do? Cry for you? Because you are an idealist. We live in a real world where everything ain't fair. Everybody don't like you. Oh, oh boy, I know I just knocked somebody off their pew or their couch. Everybody don't like you. Some people can't stand Stand you. And if, no, I won't say that. I was going to say, if you want to find out, folk like you, you become a pastor. You'll find out real quick. Their lips don't match their actions. Preach, pastor. The world, we live in a real world where you can do everything right. And folk will still treat you wrong. That's the real world. For the idealist, you need to become a realist and understand that when you take 
a blow at evil, listen to me, evil will return your blow. You can't strike out at the ungodly and think that the enemy is not going to try to strike you back. Jesus wanted me to let you know that on your way up, you will be betrayed. Not just betrayed, but you will be condemned. You're going to be judged. Folk are going to say some stuff about you. People are always going to challenge your motives. Everything you do Huh? No matter how good it is, you had a bad motive. You just wanted to be seen. And you know, y'all sit in church and say that. You see her going to bed. She just want to be seen. She got a new dress on. I'm talking about church folk. Somebody say church folk. And you know, folks will judge you on your journey. Jesus says you are going to have to deal with some of the ver verbal attacks, some verbal abuse. People will mock you, but now if you're not going up, this is not for you. Huh? Well, betrayal for Jesus came from Judas. Hmm? You're going to be betrayed by people closest to you. Listen, Judas, somebody say Judas, walk with Jesus up to this point for three and a half years. He made him the treasure of the church. <laughs> he knew Judas loved money. He knew Judas was pulling out of the teal. Judas and Jesus drank water from the same cup. They shared fish sandwiches together. They went to synagogue together. They went to Sabbath school together. They slept on cots next to each other. When they journeyed, they were very close, it appeared. But the perversion of the person that we have to deal with on your way up, there will be those who will act like friends, but they are foes. You 20, 30, and 40 year olds, you better, see by the time you get to your 40s, you just about know everybody ain't your friend. But I'm talking to you slow learner 40s. But they are against you now. This is just a reality of life. People smiling in your face are the ones who are stabbing you in your back. Now, and sometimes it's your own family members. Sometimes it's a good thing you only see them at the family reunion. I just do that in for free. Now, don't be tripping over what they are doing. Now remember what Jesus told you at the beginning of the journey. You're going up, but you still have to deal with folk who are trying to betray you. There are people who are your enemies, but act like they are your friends. Everybody don't want to see you at the next level. Everybody don't want to see your, your family make it. Everybody don't want to see you do well on your job. You think everybody happy because you got a promotion? No. No. You think everybody is happy because you got a good job? No. You think everybody's happy because you found a good man? No! There are some people who are jealous and envious and they will stab you in your back. 
These are people who appear to be friends. And here's what you've got to understand. That on your way up, there are some folk you have got to let go. Oh, Lord. On your way up, there are some folk you've got to let go. That's why some of us can't get to the next level. There are some people we can't let go. They are not for you. They are holding you down. They are holding you back. They appear to be your friends, but check out their behavior. They're acting like enemies because some people you just got to let go. In fact, why don't you say that? you let at home. There are some people, repeat after me, there are some people that I've got to let go. And you ought to visualize that person. I know what some of you are saying. Yeah, but Reverend, that, that, that's, not, that, that, that's not scripture. You've got to show people mercy. Oh, I do? Okay, I'm glad you brought that up. Jesus was eating the Last Supper with his disciples. Listen up. I, I, I know I may be a little long today, and I ain't apologizing. Now, he was eating the Last Supper with his disciples. One of you, he says, will betray me. And you know what the disciples start saying? Is it I? Is it I? And you know what Judas says? Is it I? Come on, Judas. You've already been making plans with the chief priests and scribes. And the Bible says Judas got up and he left the Lord's Supper. Now let me tell you what did not happen when he left. Jesus did not go after him, y'all. Wait a minute, baby. Wait, wait, wait. Some people on your way up, you have got to let some people go. What about mercy? When people have made up their mind on you, there's nothing you can do about that. Their mind is made up. And some of you aren't getting this. Let me see, let me see. You know what NASA found out? They found out that when they launched those spaceships, the higher that spaceship would go, more stuff would fall off. And that's in order for them to break through the stratosphere. You can't have everything hanging on him because I got to break through. Somebody say, I got to break through. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. If you're going to keep going up, there is some stuff you have got to let go. Some habit you've got to drop off. Some friends you've got to kiss goodbye. Some places you've got to stop going. Some conversations you've got to stop engaging in. Some thought process you've got to change. Some freaky friendship. You know, sometimes I look at TikTok, and they got a trend on there going now. And, well, you know, I try to stay up with the culture that I'm preaching to. And, and, and he says, we going to break up? Oh, you mean there's no more sex? Yes. 
That's what it means. Freaky friendships. Friends with benefits. You've got to let it go. Because remember, Jesus was betrayed with a kiss. And Judas kissed him in public, which showed their identity and closeness. But everybody kissing on you ain't for you. Everybody kissing on you ain't for you. Look at somebody and tell them, let them go. Tell one more person, let them go. And sometimes the people you have to deal with on your way up are religious people. Oh, I, I'm sorry, y'all. I couldn't cut none of this out. I got to tell you. Because it's in the text, and if it's in the text, I got to preach it. Huh? On your way up, you are going to run into some religious people with no relationship with God. You mull that one around a minute. The text says, chief priest and scribe, teachers of the law. They made up the group that was considered the chief priest. They were the theological expert of that day and time. And when the teachers of the law, the scribes, they were the experts in the scripture, the Torah. They would explain to people what the Bible meant. These are the religious people. But they had no relationship with God. Just because you are religious doesn't mean you are righteous. Ooh, I think I just dropped a bomb there. It does not mean that you are in right standing with God. Just because you hold the title of chief priest doesn't mean that you have a true testimony. Just because you wear certain clothes don't make you a Christian. Just because you come to the house of God doesn't mean you in the family. Plenty of folk come to your house ain't in your family. Don't you start tripping with religious folk. Listen, church folks are the biggest judges they can judge you. I didn't say Christians, I said church folk. Huh? Why don't somebody shout it right now? Church folk! Say it again, church folk! Always have something to say. No matter how good you've done, they find the bad. No matter how right you are, they look for the wrong. The biggest judges. And when you're on your way up, it's these religious folk who begin to condemn you, who begin to judge you. They are always looking for something to say. How you gonna judge Jesus? What you judging him on? He healed the sick. He gave sight to the blind. He fed the hungry. Uh, what's your issue with him? Well, Here's their issue. He did it huh, on the Sabbath day. He didn't follow our tradition. He didn't ask us, wait a minute, you mean he's got to check with you before he gives sight to the blind? He's got to check with you before he heals the withered hand? He got to check with you? Huh. He said, you will be mocked, and the mocking, the beating, guess where it came from? And you know where it came from? It came from the Gentiles, the Roman government, the Roman soldiers. Let me, let me grab this a minute.
the Roman soldiers, the Romans, and I had to put this in here, they don't even know who Jesus is. They couldn't even identify him. That's why they needed Judas to kiss him. They didn't know what he looked like. What issues did they have with him? You see, you've got folk talking about you don't even know what you look like. What problems do you have with Jesus? You don't even know about him. You don't even know about Jehovah. Listen, the world doesn't need a reason to kill you. Did you hear that? On your way up, there's going to be some folk who don't even know you, who have never met you. I'm just, I'm just about through. You, they never met you. You never shook their hands, never shared a meal with them. They will be the ones trying to bring you down. The world don't need a reason to dog you. Now, here's the thing, and I'm, I'm getting ready to close now. <laughs> now, here's the thing <laughs> for many of us. I, I hope this word has helped somebody today. <laughs> Here, here's the thing for many of us. We have missed out going to the next level because we keep tripping over the persecutions and the perversions. <laughs> Somehow, we just about ready to make it, and then we want to give up. Because they were talking about you, talking about you. God, ain't nobody in this church been talked about more than me, and I don't care. I'm still yet alive. They said I was going to hell. I ain't there yet. Hello. And they said it about you, too. And then... We want to give up because they were talking about you. They don't like you. <laughs> they, they, they dogging you. Do you know why? Because you're in <laughs> the red zone. Somebody say red zone. You're getting ready <laughs> to score. <laughs> you're getting ready <laughs> to get your victory. <laughs> You're getting ready to make your goal. Getting ready to reach your aspirations. Now the defense is getting a little tighter on you. But don't worry because you've got Jesus on your side. Don't turn around. Now you know what? Before you give up, before you think about quitting, before you give up on Christ, on the church, and not even dealing with your purpose, before you do that, I want you to think about how far you've already come. And our ancestors was right. Sometimes on your journey, they used to say, my soul looks back and wonder. How, how I got over, you've come 80 yards, it's been a struggle, and you take time to look back, and while you're looking back, you said, they had a personal file on me over there, they ran me out of bound over there, they kicked me over there, but by the grace of God, I'm holding on, I'm holding on. And while you're holding, you got to do a little self-talk. What are you talking about? While you're holding on and keep gaining your strength, you got to say, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. You got to keep holding on. You got to let them know that greater is he that's in me than he that is in the world. And I tell you, you start getting regenerated. He will renew your strength 
Won't he do it? Won't he do it? I don't know how far you've got to carry that ball. I don't know how God's going to do it. Sometimes he does it vertically. Uh huh. He'll use somebody else to help you get to your goal. He'll throw you a play. And then you got to run and say, Thank God. I made it. I made it. And sometimes the blessing comes horizontally when God Himself will throw you a pass. Hey, and you can run. I made it. I made it. And once you catch the ball and you're in the end zone, you got to celebrate. You got to do the rosemary. Thank you, 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 thank you. What an awesome God. Don't give up on God. The song is right. He hasn't given up on you. You you in the end zone. I've always wanted to do that. I ain't going to spike it because I don't know where it'll go. But I've always wanted to do that too. Why you in the end zone? Hey! Listen. Please don't forget this. When it looks like you're catching hell from every side, it may not be that you're doing something wrong. It may be verification that you're doing something right. And Satan is trying to discourage you to quit. And he'll come over the, well, you know, Pastor Nick ain't what I thought he was. He ain't going nowhere to prepare nothing for you. You ain't coming here because of him or me. You coming here because of your relationship with God. And to use a term that they use, huh, you ain't going to worry me. Did this word help anybody? Those of you who are watching by way of live stream, don't throw in the towel. Don't give up. There's nothing wrong with sometimes looking back and remembering how God brought you. And he brought you just like he brought Israel with a mighty hand. And then, you know, David was at the lowest point of his life. He had been running from Saul, some say for 15 to 20 years. Saul's one mission was to try to kill him. And after running 15 years or 20 years, the Bible says, that David was at his lowest ebb. And you know what he did? He encouraged himself in the Lord. Now, what does that mean? And you need to remember this, because I've had to use it many, many, many times in my personal life. David started thinking about all of the victories that he had in his life because of the Lord. And if you've ever had any conversation about continuing to make it, one thing I tell almost everybody, when you're going through bad times, start thinking about the good things. When bad things start happening, start thinking about how God blessed you back then. Then you'll start saying, he's done it before, and I know he'll do it again. Don't throw in the towel. I don't know who it was, but God really wanted somebody to hear this. 
Don't throw in the towel. You've come too far. God has too much invested in you. He's got Calvary invested in you. He's got the resurrection invested in you. You just hang on in there. And I like what our ancestors used to say. I want to see <laughs> what the end's going to be. And I just told a young person yesterday on the phone, I said, you don't need a whole lot of friends. You don't. You know, when we young, we want everybody to like us. Everybody ain't going to like you for whatever reason. You don't need a whole lot of friends. You don't need a whole lot of road dogs. Because what a friend we have in Jesus. I'm done. Oh, I, I, I want to thank Pastor Nick. You know, I used to do a lot of this dramatization, and it was this morning that it hit me. I said, you know what, if I had a football. So right away I texted him. I said, Nick, you got a football? He said, no, but I can get one right quick if you want one. I said, get it. Because, see, I believe in visuals. That's why I wish more people would watch the service rather than listen to it. Listening to it is good. But visual, you remember more. So, um, thanks, Pastor Nick. I really appreciate you. I had to tell. And listen, y'all, I haven't had my hand on a football probably in 50 or 60 years. And I, I said, Lord, please let me catch that. <clears throat> but wait a minute. I said, well, Lord, <laughs> if I don't catch it <laughs> and I drop it, <laughs> You know what I was going to say? <laughs> That's all right, <laughs> because he's the God of another chance. <laughs> Come on, Pastor Nick. <laughs>